Distinguished guests, colleagues, members of the press, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this very special event. My name is Kent Anderson and I'm the director of the ANU School of Culture, History and Language. As the School of Culture, History and Language, we take those subjects very seriously and therefore I'm always proud to note that we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. It's not every day that I have the privilege of introducing a Deputy Prime Minister and I must say it is with great pleasure that I welcome our distinguished guest today. Welcome sir, Salama Dalam. To the ANU, we are honored by your visit here and see it as a recognition of our tradition of Malaysian and Malay studies at the ANU. Your presence on our campus is a symbol of enduring relationship as educators, scholars, neighbors, and most importantly, as friends. As most in the audience will know, Tan Sri Dr. Haji Muhyiddin is Malaysia's Minister of Education, as well as Deputy Prime Minister. I was very interested to learn that holding the education portfolio is normally a prerequisite to becoming Prime Minister. The high value placed on education says profound things about Malaysia's national commitment to ensuring that its citizens are educated, prosperous, and engaged. His Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, grew up in Johor, and I am advised that Johor is a state with a reputation for independent-mindedness and self-reliance. Elected as a member of Parliament for Pago in 1978, he was appointed first Federal Territories and later Deputy Trade and Industry Minister from 1986 to 1985. He was Chief Minister of his home state, in 1995, he was appointed to the Malaysian cabinet as Minister of Youth and Sports. After the 1999 election, he became Minister of Domestic Trade and, and Consumer Affairs. From 2004 until 2008, he served as Minister of Agriculture and later as Minister of International Trade and Industry. He was appointed Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education on the 9th of April, 2009. Educated in economics and Malay studies with a wealth of experience in this vast variety of portfolios, our distinguished guest is Prime Minister and Education Minister of a state with 28 million people and a country that faces major challenges as it seeks to participate in an increasingly globalized world. This is a particular challenge for ruling the United and coalition partners, whose record of unbroken rule, I understand, exceeds that of all other elected governments in power today. We look forward to the Deputy Prime Minister outlining how the government will seek to address the new challenges it faces. The Deputy Prime Minister is very familiar with Australia and with Australian-Malaysian relationships having, among many other things, hosted Prime Minister Gillard when she visited Kuala Lumpur one year ago, and more recently hosting Minister Stephen Smith at the Five Power Defense Arrangements meeting in Kuala Lumpur earlier this month, or last month. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, our Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good morning. Uh, Mr. Ken Anderson. Uh, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it's a bit too early for me to become 
Australian citizen and be <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister at the same time. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm happy to be close in Australia. Australia is not uh, foreign to me. I've been coming here on a number of occasions in different capacities. And of course, I love to come to Australia because it's such a big country. A lot of spaces to breathe and of course to do a lot of things, to sports. And of course, uh, <clears throat> after this uh, stopover in Canberra, I'll be moving to, Ken, uh, to Perth, meeting some Malaysian students, visiting one Malaysian operations, uh, successfully been uh, put there for many years in Perth. <clears throat> But allow me first to begin by saying, of course, how delighted I am to once again uh, visit this beautiful country. This time at the invitation of the Australian National University. Of course, it is a great honour to be able to address such a distinguished audience and in such a distinguished surroundings. The ANU, as we know, has ably educated many of my fellow countrymen, as it has uh, many of South Asia's best, and it is only right that I take this opportunity to say how appreciative I am of this esteemed institution. <clears throat> Prior to walking here from where we were this morning, we have a chance to meet the Vice-Chancellor, Mr. Yan Yang, and the uh, discussion was focused on how we could enhance further our <coughs> collaborations, and I have agreed in principle to the setting up of the Malaysian Chair for Malaysian or Malay Studies here in the ANU. So we'll be working with the Ministry of Higher Education in Malaysia and see how fast that this project can take off here in ANU. <coughs> Thank you. I have been invited uh, <coughs> this morning to speak about my country, to reflect a bit on Malaysia's history, and to speak about where it is heading. As some of you would know, Malaysia has embarked on an ambitious economic, governmental, and even political transformation. We aim to be not merely a high-income nation by the year 2020, but in the words of our vision 2020, a fully developed one. There are, of course, no certainties. I also do not have to tell you that the world economy is more than a little shaky at the moment. Nevertheless, I hope to convince you that we are fully committed to this path of progress. And, of course, I hope to show you that it is not merely a case that we can do it, but that we must. Now, our journey, of course, officially began in 1957, when the nation gained independence. In reality, however, the seeds were sown well before then. Australia and Malaysia share common colonial past, but one that is fundamentally different in many ways. One key difference was that from the very first day that Malaysia was formed, it was ethnically and religious, religiously polarized. And this is not something that we have to be apologetic about. It was a condition that to a very large extent was inherited from two centuries of British rule and could have easily proved to be a liability as it had elsewhere in the world. In order to win independence from Britain, however, it was necessary for the various races and cultures to come together. Thus, in what uh, scholars have referred to as the great bargain, it could equally be called the great accommodation. Large numbers of Chinese and Indian immigrants then who offered citizenship in return for accepting the role of the Malay rulers, Islam, and the Malay language in the newly created country. Certain other rights were also accorded to the Malays and the Bumiputras in the federal constitution, specifically in assisting them to improve their well-being. In 1963, when Sabah and Sarawak joined the federation, there was the added spatial dimension. 
that had to be added to the ethnic and religious ones in nation building. Now when you hear the term nation building be used in Malaysia, it is not just about the creation and strengthening of political and civil institutions, it is about the welding together of different races, different religions and of course localities into one cohesive nation. Uh, 53 years down the road, uh, this is still a work in progress, but more about this and one Malaysia later. Wherever there are highly dissimilar communities, there will be ignorance of each other. Dissimilarities of worldviews and quite often disparities in the income and living standards. And this was also the case of Malaysia. In 1957, the vast majority of Malays lived in highly impoverished rural areas with poor or no public amenities. Large rubber companies that had been established by the British were generally doing well, but not so for the many small and isolated Malay farmers. Poverty rates were very high, affecting more than one in every two households. And in the meantime, Chinese and Indian businesses and professional classes dominated the affluent urban areas, with Malays serving mainly in government and, of course, the military. And these were the cards that were dealt at the time of independence. We could have let these uh, outcomes and events that followed be dictated to us as we could try, or we could try to work through and around them to shape outcomes and events. We chose the latter course of action. And thus development became the critical strategy to ensure stability and unity. Political legitimacy in Malaysia has never been solely based on who won more votes at the polls, it has been based on who can deliver the goods in a way that satisfies the various communities. The five-year Malaysia plan have therefore been and continued to be a very important documents to this day. Now, despite the efforts made, it was apparent after a decade of independence that not enough was being done. The Malays and natives of Peninsular Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, were being fast left behind economically, even as they were being challenged politically. In an event that deeply scarred the nation, communal rights broke out in May 13, 1969. The riots were a national tragedy of that one can be very sure of. But if there was a positive role side, a positive side to it, it was that it brought national focus and reflection on how to proceed. Now, after multi-party consultations, the decision was made to accelerate the fortunes of the Bumiputras through mass affirmative actions, thus the birth of the new economic policy, or the NEP. The NEP was conceived as a bold attempt to eradicate poverty regardless of ethnicity and to restructure society so as to eliminate the identification of race with economic function. It also explicitly recognized that in order for it to work, there had to be economic growth. It was not, not a crude means to merely transfer wealth from one party to another. Now, this is why the tractors of the NEP have been unable to explain why the period following the instruction was marked by economic growth rather than disaster, as they predicted. In 1970s, for example, growth rates averaged 6%, and this rose to around 8% for most of the 1980s and the 1990s. And it was at this time that Malaysia managed its first economic transformation, namely to diversify itself from primary commodity exports to manufactured products. The reason why transformation was possible at all was because Malaysia, which was already highly export-oriented at the time of independence, opened itself further to the forces of globalization. 
Openness has, for better and worse, been a distinguishing feature of the Malaysian economy. Tariffs and non-tariff barriers were progressively brought down as the government coveted and collectively or actively courted foreign direct investment and provided a generous tax and other incentives to attract it. The FDI helped to absorb the large numbers of unemployed and underemployed and lifted large numbers out of poverty. The high propensity of foreign investment meant that export from their productions, management skills, and technology has enabled the country to industrialize and break the resource trap that had tightly gripped many countries. At the same time, we undertook important measures to build lasting institutions and regulatory systems that facilitated economic activities and, of course, balanced the economic structure. In 1990, Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad gave a speech that galvanized the country and, of course, the developing world, simply entitled Malaysia, the way forward. It contained references to Vision 2020, which set out the aim of being a fully developed nation by 2020. And this emphasized not just development in economic terms, but holistically. Now, the late 1990s to the mid 1990s, or the late 1980s to the mid 1990s, were some of the best years the Malaysian economy ever had. Malaysia was an early mover in privatization. The equity market was active. The capital account of the balance of payments were being liberalized. And foreign capital was being drawn to the Malaysian shores. Hard infrastructure, such as highways, ports, and airports were built to provide the foundation for future growth. And this was accompanied by investment in hospitals, schools, and universities to ensure that Malaysia's development is holistic and encompassing. And this scenario changed when the Asian financial crisis hit. Contrary to many ill-informed news reports of the day, Malaysia did not turn its back on globalization. In 1997, it did become a vocal critic of one of its aspects, uh, that of financial globalization. The Malaysian government also believed that we needed local solutions that would work well within the Malaysian context. And some of the measures implemented then, especially capital control, and which were regarded as highly unorthodox and undesirable, are actively being discussed and pursued even now at the G20 meetings. Now, the period following the Asian financial crisis was characterized by moderate economic growth and, of course, lower private investment rates. This, coupled with the advance of China, and other newly emerging economies on the world scene undoubtedly affected the rate of industrialization and manufacturing. Services, however, continue to grow, while Malaysia's oil, gas, and primary commodity exports saw good growth due in no small way to the rapid growth of China, but also India, Brazil, and the ASEAN countries. Now, in this environment, and as is happening elsewhere in the world, income disparities grew wider. There was an urgent need to respond to this situation, not just to avoid a political backlash, but socially instability as well. Great effort has been made to develop the middle class in Malaysia, but while there is clear evidence that this is growing, the numbers that have been left out and falling behind are obvious as well. The nature of the Malaysian society is such that while other governments may turn a blind eye to these developments, Malaysia cannot afford to do so. It is politically suicidal and, of course, nationally hazardous. 
And this is especially true when the cost of living, partly driven by energy prices, has increased significantly. Moreover, as the economy progresses, the people's needs would also be greater. There is only so much, however, that the government can do in keeping these costs down. It has a responsibility to the present generation, but also to the future one as well. And that is why it has begun to remove distortive and wasteful subsidies, expand public transport, and of course introduce affordable housing at the same time. The comprehensive answer to the welfare problems is not keeping costs down, but raising income in a productive and sustainable manner. This, I believe, is the right context to view the efforts of the government and to make Malaysia a high-income nation, and in particular, the Economic Transformation Program. Many people wrongly think of it as a means of making the rich even richer. It aim, or the aim is to raise incomes of the lowest earners so that they can do enjoy the benefits of economic growth. Now, recognizing the new landscape that Malaysia has to, to operate in order to be a high-income nation, Prime Minister Dr. Sinajib Tumraza has had to adopt a new thinking and fresh approaches. And this resulted in the commissioning of the new economic model, or the NEM, a major reconsideration of the sources and strategies for growth. Launched in 2010, the NEM has made the pursuit of high income as one of its three goals. The other two goals are inclusiveness and sustainability. And we have to master, master all our resources if we are to be a high-income nation. The Malaysian economy will have to grow at 6.5% annually for the next eight years if we are to more than double our per capita income to 15,000 US dollars by 2020. We need structural reforms and flexibility to respond to internal and external changes, all the while improving productivity and boosting incomes. Now, this is why the first track of the NEM has to do with sharpening competitiveness, promoting entrepreneurship and innovations, and building a knowledge infrastructure for human capital development. I cannot overemphasize the importance of human capital to create a large pool of intellectual, entrepreneurial, managerial, scientific, and technical talents. Obviously, however, this will not take a few years, or this will not take too long, or even a decade. It may take one or seven or two generations. As Minister of Education, I have always strived, and of course, we'll always strive to deliver high quality education for all the people, and not just some. Then improving educational facilities, strengthening teacher skills, and expanding technical education are so just a few of the many initiatives taken by the Ministry of Education to produce a strong human capital. Now the second track is attracting and stimulating investment, particularly in 12 areas. This Economic Transformation Program, or ETP that we call it, focuses on getting the private sectors to spearhead growth in industries such as oil, gas and energy, education, tourism, financial services, electrical and electronics, and palm oil. And these projects should boost economic activities, generate exports and help us reach the per capita income target that I mentioned earlier. The ETP has measurable key performance indicators and progress has to be regularly reported. All, as these investments are critical, the government has paid extra extension to facilitating their implementations. Economic transformation will only be successful if the benefits of growth are widely shared. We know that markets by themselves do not ensure 
a significant trickle-down effects. High income does not translate to all sections of society improving, and the government recognizes that. The NEM has therefore made lifting the standards of living of the bottom 40% of households as a key policy trust. More efforts are taken to increase income level of this lower income group, even as the social safety net is a large and rising cost of living mitigator. Now, the public sector is a key partner in national transformation policy journey for it is a facilitator as well as growth catalyst. Thus, in parallel with the NEM, the Government Transformation Program or GTP was initiated. The objective of the GTP is twofold. First, is to transform the government to be more effective in its delivery of services and accountable for outcomes that matter most to most people. And second, to move Malaysia forward to become an advanced, united, and just society with high standards of living for all. The GDP seeks to ensure a high service level for provision of public goods, and at the same time, the creation of governance framework for a holistic development. Seven national key result areas, or NKRAs as we call it, have been identified, namely, one, reducing crime, fighting corruption, improving student outcomes, raising living standards of low-income households, improving rural basic infrastructure, improving urban public transport, and mitigating rising cost of living. The new economic policy was the first economic transformation strategy, and it was successful in growing the Malaysian economy with stability and equity. Leading up to the NEM, the relevance and efficacy of the affirmative actions under the NEP were raised. It is clear that the objectives of the NEP, namely the eradication of poverty regardless of race and the structuring of society to eliminate identification of economic activities with ethnicity, are still relevant and important. In this regard, the economic transformation will continue the objectives of the NEP, but its implementation will be market-friendly, transparent, and based on merits and needs. The high-income nation that we aspire must be inclusive so that everyone will benefit and no group or region is marginalized. And the outcome of this transformational journey should be an economy that is competitive and globally linked, entrepreneurially and innovation charged, private investment and human capital driven, and well-functioning institutions. The private sector, of course, is expected to take a leading role, while the public sector should be a facilitator and setting the framework for economic activities. We must also be mindful that along the way, the development process is environmentally sustainable. Now, it would be naive to assume that transformations are without challenges or obstacles or missteps. Reality and experience have shown that strategies which look good on paper can remain unrealized owing to changing circumstances, or lack of resources, or implementation failure. I'm confident, however, that Malaysia can achieve its vision even though there may be many challenges. Simply put, we have been successful before and I believe we can be successful again. But we will need to be supremely level-headed and practical. Managing a small open economy that is exposed to the vagaries of the world economy is indeed a daunting task. Global or regional crises also occurring more frequently now. Unfettered global capital flows are causing havoc to investments, stock markets, and of course, exchange rates. We cannot assume that the world economy will just keep on growing. In the 2008 global financial crisis, Malaysian financial institutions stayed sound 
but trade and investments were hit hard. It is not easy to sustain high growth under this condition, but what is important is for the domestic economy to be well managed and have strong fundamentals that can see through the rough patches. Another challenge is the rising competition from other countries. And this is a challenge that is faced by all countries in the international economic system. Malaysia, of course, needs to strengthen its comparative and comparative advantages and secure a place in this system. In this globalization era, it is unwise for any country to compete unnecessarily. Instead, they should find ways to cooperate and, of course, to collaborate. We also should take a positive view and regard these challenges as signals to prompt changes in the domestic economy so that we will remain competitive. From an internal perspective, striking a balance between economic growth and equity is Malaysia's key challenge because of the status and needs of the various ethnic groups and regions. The focus on lifting the income of the bottom 40% regardless of ethnicity, is an extension of the earlier approach adopted in the NEP. More development will be implemented for marginalized regions where poverty is still prevalent, such as in Sabah, Sarawak, and Kelantan, and to ensure that difference in levels of progress between these areas and the more developed parts of Malaysia will not be as large. Another area where striking a balance is crucial is between economic sectors. We have found that the impact of global crisis on Malaysia is less severe because of the balanced economic structure. For example, where demand for manufacturing goods slumped, the strong demand for primary commodities exports, such as palm oil and petroleum, provided a useful counterbalance. Likewise, a vibrant services sector is vital in expanding domestic consumption which form the largest component of the economy. Now, transformation vision and strategies will only produce the desired results if they receive the support of all stakeholders. And inclusive growth will foster a sense of belonging and the desire to contribute to nation building. For most of the people, the measure of success in high-income nation is not based on how many skyscrapers are built, but on how efficient public transport is, how affordable is health care, how reasonable is the cost of houses, how good are the schools, and of course how high is the inflation. In other words, the biggest challenge is how to ensure that the benefits of economic progress are distributed fairly to the ordinary citizens. As a multi-ethnic and multicultural, multi-religious society, National unity is paramount for Malaysia to progress and achieve its aspirations. The fact that we had made good progress in many areas and at the same time maintained national unity is widely acknowledged. Not many countries are successful in managing such diversity while delivering good economic growth and social development. We need to continue to harness this unity through the One Malaysia concept of People First Performance Now. National unity will be enhanced when people or the rakyat is the priority in terms of distribution of economic benefits, focus on government programs, and delivery of public services. And it is important that Malaysians progress from just being tolerant to one another's culture to accepting our differences and leveraging on our diversity can instead be our strength and source of advancement. Of late, because there has been robust discussions on political transformation and for more political space, the third and least publicized is the political transformation program that is undertaken as part of the journey to be a developed country. In the political transformation program, the government takes cognizance of the need to change, be relevant, and reinvent in a way that meets the aspirations of our people. We are conscious of the fact that we need to do this step by step, but also make tangible progress. 
the repeal of the International Internal Security Act and other emergency acts this year is an indication of the government's initiative to provide a conducive and right environment for a high income and developed nations. The Singh guest, ladies and gentlemen, is if there is one thing that I hope to have disabused you this morning, it is the idea that Malaysia is undertaking economic and political transformation simply because we want to be more affluent. Of course, we want to be affluent, but that is not the driving motivations and indeed would not be sufficient for the many heavy sacrifices that have to be made. The reason for these transformations are being undertaken is because it is the only way to permanently solidify social peace and tranquility in our country. I've stepped back in Malaysian history because I wanted to demonstrate that the new economic model and the economic transformation program should be seen as a continuum of government policies and efforts, all of which have had this unwavering aim. I hope this has given you a better understanding of what the Malaysian government is doing and the sense of things to come. I wish to again thank the ANU for the invitations and the platform to come forward today and share Malaysia's development vision, aspirations and journey with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has agreed to take uh, some questions for about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we'll take those one at a time and I'll just act as traffic controller when I see the hands. Start one here. Thank you, Nancy, for your talk. Um, acknowledging your current um, administration uh, commitment on political reforms, I would like to ask you um, why was the government uh, why was the government so expedient on um, on passing the law of uh, peaceful assembly act and why were the recommendations from the bar council uh, not considered in the formation of the act? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I sort of anticipate that this question will come here. <laughs> it's a hot subject. But of course, uh, as you know, Prime Minister Natusri Najib, on the eve of the celebration of Malaysian independence on 16th of September this year, made a very, I would say, important speech, which basically means uh, recognizing that uh, Malaysia has moved forward. We need to provide more space in terms of expressions and, of course, to ensure that Malaysians can participate more effectively in all, all walks of life, that he has announced a few major decisions of the government. Basically, of course, one is the ISA, the abolition of ISA, the repeal of the emergency ordinance I've mentioned earlier, and a few other legal instruments. And that has been uh, done at parliament level. On this issue of the uh, <clears throat> Peaceful Assembly Bill, which were tabled just a few weeks back. It is just another of those uh, indications or manifestation of what we believe is needed. Uh, as you know, prior to this, of course, uh, Assembly of Salt by uh, Malaysia is not something which we sort of uh, restricted. There are processes and procedures uh, basically being handled by the police under what we call the Section 27 of the Police Act where you can assemble, but before that, of course, you have to apply for permits. There are rules and regulations that need to be fulfilled. In some cases, you are allowed to do it. In some cases, you are not allowed to do it. This new bill, of course, provides much wider avenue. There is no restriction. I've uh, asked some information. What are the latest information as they got the Peaceful Assembly Act? Now, one, of course, uh, under Section 27 of the Police Act, which is the previous act before this Assembly Act was uh, enacted and approved by Parliament. Application for license is a must for all assemblies. Now, the new Peaceful Assembly Act, which we were just passed in Parliament, no license is required, only a notification. So very much an improvement of what it was before. And uh, <clears throat> notification is not required for assemblies 
held at designated places and other assemblies specified in the third schedule. So in the previous, uh, of course, rules, is you have to apply, you have to state, state specifically where you want to have it, but now with this uh, laws uh, which is passed and of course hope will be uh, <clears throat> to, uh, put into force very soon, uh, you could just assemble anywhere you like and if this, those are the desert areas which have already been, been determined, been predetermined early by the authorities can serve basically by the police, there is no need for you to apply for license. You just gather there and speak as loud as you want and as many as people can gather. So it is a much better improvement because it's no, we will not say we we'll stop you from doing it. Uh, and then, of course, <clears throat> the uh, procedures before that you need certain time. And now the uh, laws has already provided for a much shorter period, and organizers shall ten days before the date of the assembly notify the officer in charge of the police district in which the assembly is to be held. So instead of the earlier proposition of thirty days, it has been reduced to ten days. But even after five days of submission, there's no response from the authority, you can proceed to have whatever gatherings and assembly that you want. So that's, uh, that's I think, is an improvement. And, uh, <clears throat> well, in the earlier laws under Section 27 of the Police Act, an assembly which takes place without license shall be deemed unlawful. Now, assembly under the present Act may proceed as proposed if the OCPD, the Officer in Charge of the Police Department, does not respond to the notification within five days of receipt of such notice. So basically, there's no restriction. So obviously, you can compare to the old laws, which is brought in under what we call the Police Act, and this specific law is a much better law. The only thing that people raise here issue is why do you allow people to demonstrate on the streets? That uh, we believe is not really necessary. Of course, the Bar Council feel is sort of moving assembly, something which they feel would provide more avenue for people to express themselves and know whatever it is they want to do. But uh, I think while we respect the, uh, the, uh, the rights of people to assemble, because we have so to protect the interests of the majority. So what you want is to provide it by this new law. There's no restriction. The law provides better avenues. The police cannot restrict you totally from whatever you want to do. So I believe, I mean, in very simple term, it is much better law. So it provides better avenue formulations to organize things and say whatever you want. Yeah. Excellent. Minister, following on from that uh, question, and in your answer you mentioned the police still have 10 days to uh, either allow the assembly to go ahead. That still seems that uh, it's very much an arbitrary decision by the police to stop the demonstrations. And therefore, in that context, what's the government's attitude towards the growth in the use of social media, particularly by the younger generation in Malaysia, on these issues? Well, I think uh, we, have, we are part of the global community. It is something that we have accepted that the social media plays a very important role. And there's no way that we can restrict, no way that we can stop even though there are certain laws that could apply for it uh, in case you are seditious or whatever it is, there are certain laws. That you can, but basically, it has become, I would say, uh, an instrument of expression, not just by young people. I think even people like us now are much more savvy than you used to be 10 or 20 years ago. So, but uh, we do recognize this role. And the uh, cabinet, much, much earlier before, has already made a decision that we are not going to censor anything, uh, or the internet for that matter. Uh, but uh, we would like to see Malaysians in general, of course, the global community at large, be responsible for whatever you do. Not that you are above the law. The certain thing that you spell out in your blogs, in your Twitters and whatnot, it, it has created certain problems to the community at large. It is also the responsibility of any government to ensure that they must maintain peace and stability at all times. So I think uh, while we do acknowledge the important role that social media has played in, in terms of uh, developing intellectual capacity, in terms of communicating, in terms of expanding knowledge in many, many fields, it is a, a standard that we have accepted today. And I think Malaysia is not an exception. It is something that we believe is important. But uh, we will have to deal with it as we get along. I think something that uh, there's no law to govern uh, what we call the expression in, uh, in the internet, and but of course, as we say, if a certain expressions 
would create a certain uh, conditions in society that will affect social stability or political stability. Or it has created the dissensions among the population, especially in Malaysia we have got a mixed race and religion. We are very particular about that. We have experienced in 1969. So there must be some way of managing those things. So what we want to see, of course, is more important citizens. Of course, social media is something we wish to acknowledge. Uh, it is a standard norm nowadays, than an exception. Ken, I've been standing here for five minutes. I'm sure you've noticed me. Tansri, selamat datang ke Canberra, selamat datang ke ANU, good to have you here. Um, just uh, <coughs> the expert opinion on uh, the peaceful assembly bill uh, is contrary to your views, I think. There is consensus. Professor Mander Witting, an expert on Malaysian law, has written on the new Mandela. You can read it for yourself. But my question is different. Tansri, I, I want to ask you for two guarantees. Can you, as Deputy Prime Minister, guarantee that Barisan National will not use violence to stop, to retain power? Can you, as, as a representative of Barisan National, guarantee that you will not declare emergency before the next general election? And can you, as Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia, guarantee that you will not declare election, uh, emergency after the 13th general election to annul the results? Thank you. You have made a prediction like the WN will lose. I'm not saying that. I'm asking you for... How sure are you that the WN will lose? Yes, precisely my Question. point. So, so I'm asking that you for the question will not be relevant, but of course I think I can accept that. Let's be very intellectual about it. I think uh, for the last 54 years, we've gone through these political uh, challenges in our system. Uh, I think in 12 elections, there are times that we won with a thumping majority. Uh, Two-thirds is something quite a standard norm for Malaysian politics. And when you have two-thirds, I'm no as a party, in some cases, do have more than 51% of those seats. We could easily form our own Malay government, but we don't, because we agree that we have to share this. And this is the BN uh, coalition concepts all about sharing of power. So respective whether whichever party is dominant in terms of the number of seats, we work together. And it's been working very well. Of course, there are certain times, and the last 2008, very classic example, when we lost the two-third majority. And because at the same time we lost a number of states. For example, the state of Kelantan, Penang, uh, Perak, Kuslango, Wilayah Kusutuan. Now, if you feel that there is some way of government manipulating the situation, whether through process of elections or through other enforcement agencies, you could uh, imagine from what you have anticipated, there could be some problem. But we don't. And we, we do accept because we have been very major in our political understanding of the whole process. We respect the constitution, we respect the views of the people, we accept any decision though it is not in our favour, sometimes in, in elections, sometimes in the court of law. Uh, we have been always, I would say, uh, subject to all these laws. We have been respecting this all the time. And there's no problem. I think it's a, I think some Malaysians have been quite used to the way how the BN government uh, acts itself uh, responsibly. You see, uh, even though uh, sometimes uh, in cases like 1969, there were, of course, racial rights because of that. It is not because the government uh, acted, because the opposition took it, a position at that time to provoke people, and people came out into the streets, and there were rights in 1969. So I do not believe that we will need to face that problem anymore, because be a responsible government means we're not thinking of our own political party. We're not thinking of our own self. We take care of the nation as a whole. We respect any decision that people make. And I think people do make their own decision based on fair assessment. So to presume in this stage there will be emergency, to presume in this stage there will be chaos, I fear that might come from the other side. Because what people are that. thinking along. 
So you, what, there's you possibly assure, you assure on Malaysians, the side, you assure Malaysians that Barisan National will not. Barisan government is always a responsible government. Thank As you I said, this is proven and tested for 54 years. So there is no need for Malaysians to be worried about. Yeah. Sure. Salam Sujatra Tantri. Uh, my family comes from Moa, where you come from. So, a question is uh, thank you for your response to Greg's question. And as a follow on, um, does your response now suggest that because political transformation can very well be a double edged sword, does that suggest then that Parisan National is willing to become the opposition after the 13th general election? And therefore, will you be willing then to help? Barista National as the leader of the opposition if that happens. You this is the, an intellectual question. You ask the government, you ask the party be in government. We don't want to be opposition. <laughs> you ask party like me, a person. I'm the deputy president of Abno and deputy president of Barista National. Of course I don't want to be opposition. But it is not me, it is the people. It is the vote that counts. What do they decide? If at the end of the day the people feel that BN is still the best government, they'll choose I'll be the government. But if they decide otherwise, like the case, of Slango, you become the government. I know because you are wearing that yellow shirt. <laughs> so we, we have been matured enough. I think for five decades that have gone through all the system, Malaysians understand what politics is all about. They want to make decisions which they believe is good for them. Not that they have been misled or whatever, but whatever decision. And every time uh, uh, a by election, for example, that we had in Malaysia, there are 16 by elections. I think it must be a world, world record of sort. And I, I, I managed the eight of the, uh, of the 16 by elections. And uh, there are cases where we lost. There are opposition who believe that there must be some meddling of the votes. Now, if I can meddle the votes, why should I lose? I should win all the time. But no, I lost. But also at the same time, I win. So, I mean, there are, these are the things, the facts of life in Malaysia that people should understand. There must be trust in the system. The institution has been set up not because the BN government set it up and it has to be always pro BN. They have been very professional. The election commission has been professional. The way how the voting system is managed is very professional. There are opposition who sits there and watch how the counting is being done. There are people from the BN government who sit down there and watch how it is being done. It's a fair, I would say, a fair and free election. So this is a fact that we have to accept. But you ask me, would you prepare to be in opposition? Well, if people decide so, I accept it. But people decide in my favor, you have to accept it as well. But you ask me as a party, I am. I don't want to be in opposition. You ask me at the end, or that I'm not uh, vice uh, deputy president, I wouldn't want to be in opposition. I want to be ruling the country because I need to serve the people. I can do a lot more than what they have done for the last 54 years. Uh, name of Vision, uh, a PhD student at ANU. Your Excellency, I have two questions. Number one, how could you manage to uh, maintain education as a top priority at your country? Education? Num education, okay. yes, number one. Number two, what about the conflict of political conflict among your political ambitions, I mean, and your country, and the economic ambitions. Well, Is it like course, a big yeah. challenge? Thank you. Well, of course, uh, we have always from the beginning emphasized the importance of education. I mentioned in my speech earlier that when we gained independence, more than 60% of the Malaysian people are poor. And the way to get out of that is, of course, through education. You know, for the many years that we have been ruling this country, Malaysia, education has always been one of the top agenda. In terms of budget, for example, more than 26% of national budget is spent on education, both at the primary as well as secondary and higher education as well. And uh, a lot of money has been spent to build infrastructure, uh, to develop the schools, to provide the teachers. We have about half a million teachers in the country. And uh, we believe this is one of the more important way of, of moving people forward, raising the standard of living, put them into position of higher income, no other way except through education. 
And for that reason, we are prepared to spend that amount of money. Uh, while that is so, I uh, have made some important announcement in Kuala Lumpur that uh, we now are undertaking a major study and review of the whole total education system in Malaysia. While we believe we have achieved uh, very much uh, success in many fields of education since independence until today, there was just one report which was done about 40 years ago, which was called the Razak Report. The Razak Report, Razak was the uh, father of Prime Minister now. He studied and he prepared the full report, and we used that report to implement fully the National Education Policy and National Education Act. But there was a 40 years time uh, that we have gone through. So we believe now is the right time to look into it again and see how Malaysians could move forward in terms of implementing education systems and, of course, programs that we believe would enhance further our standards of education in our country. The level to those who are in developed nations uh, like Australia, US, and Europe, and many other countries. So we are trying to look at the best models. So this is what we're going to do now. I don't think there's any conflict between uh, raising standards of people and political uh, transformation at the same time. And when we explain the need for political transformation is the, the fact that we acknowledge uh, that we have achieved a degree of maturity. Malaysians now need more space. They are responsible. They know what is good for them. That should be given much more room to express of course, we participate actively in political processes. Uh, we don't restrict anybody to join any political parties. You can join, you can form many, many political parties in the country, no restrictions. And these are the things that we acknowledge. So, but uh, that is part and parcel of nation building, part and parcel of uh, developing and moving Malaysia forward in the next uh, 10 years so to be a developed nation, not developed by only economic standard, but also it has to be holistic in terms of other development as well, which is political maturity, ability to what I call uh, develop oneself, to move into any area that one would like to, to be what one would like to be. So this is the thing that we believe is important for Malaysia. So there is no real conflict in terms of major transformation that we talk about in economic terms, the economic transformation, the government transformation, the national economic models, of course, the uh, the uh, political transformation that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is what uh, we have been doing. A uh, few bills that were tabled in Parliament the last few weeks is very strong manifestation that we, we walk the talk, we do what we believe is important, not just for the political parties, but for the people as well. So I think uh, in total, there must be a holistic approach to nation building, total development. It's not just economic or infrastructure, but of course, uh, intellectuals and other fields as well. Political, of course, development is important. Yeah. Last question. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. Um, to an issue very much uh, in the centre of the Australian political debate, and that's the uh, the failed Malaysia solution. Um, what would your? We can't argue that we've seen a recent influx of boats carrying more passengers and coming closer to the mainland. What's your message to the Australian opposition? And secondly, have you spoken recently with Australian ministers or do you plan to? Well, I don't have any scheduled meeting with any official of the government, because, uh, but uh, the, uh, the case in, in point, because you mentioned about the arrangement that we proposed, of, actually Australia's proposed to work with Malaysia on the uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, no go. That's it. Okay, we, we respect it. The majority of the decision of the parliament has not approved that. But uh, there are many other areas of collaboration that we believe Malaysia could have with Australia. We, we have a long arrangement in the fields of trade investments, uh, in terms of education, in the fields of social and sports development. So I think, uh, which is important, I, I don't think I have the rights or the uh, position to advise political parties in Australia what they can do and what they cannot do. <laughs> that is what you, you, you meant by your question. But I think uh, we should look forward to many, many uh, avenues that Malaysia should explore. This, Australia is a great nation, and Malaysia too. We want to see within the next uh, 10 to 20 years how could we move forward from where we are today. Uh, you are a member of the TPP. Malaysia, of course, joined the TPP. The negotiation is moving very well. They could 
hopefully that will be the, uh, the free trade agreement of the 21st century. Uh, we want to share this uh, expanding uh, uh, global economy, but of course at the same time we know we have to face the challenges. And there's no other asking options better than working and collaborating together with neighbours. Of course, Australia is our important neighbours, so uh, we hope that uh, we will move forward together. Unfortunately, we are out of time. There's lots of questions. I have a follow-up question on the asylum seeker in Malaysia's view of Malaysia dealing with the problem as asylum seekers in Malaysia. It's something the Australian public would like to Well, it, 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 it is a challenge, a very major challenge that we're facing today uh, at home. Uh, of course, uh, the home ministry is, of course, the other important agency is working very hard for it. Uh, you are actually spared in sense because of the, the fact that you are a big island, the whole continent, the distance uh, far away from major people who are <coughs> moving from, I don't know, from many other countries of the world. So we, we try to manage it, it's not easy. And the uh, enforcement agency is always on the toes to see how we can do that. Uh, of course there are uh, problems. While well, uh, we are not, of course, uh, a signatory to the Convention of Refugees, uh, when there are refugees, you know, the Viet Vietnam uh, came, those were the years. We put them in the whole island, we managed to feed them, do whatever we can, though we are not signatory to that, because it's basically humanitarian problems. So we do look into that as, uh, as, a, as a way that we need to help. But uh, of course, it's a subject that uh, not dealt on Malaysia's alone. We collaborated with many other countries, we worked with our neighbors, and of course, we worked with our so-called uh, members within the Commonwealth. So there are so many uh, working groups that will form a regular meeting and discussion how this uh, uh, standard operating procedures can be established so that uh, countries can share and help each other in this area. It is, it is a difficult subject matter, but of course something that we need to do to deal with. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but fortunately, uh, there's a reception immediately following this and the, Prime Minister, or the Deputy Prime Minister is available uh, for 30 minutes. So uh, in a more informal setting, hopefully you can pursue some of these questions. Please join me in thanking the Deputy Prime Minister.